Good evening, and welcome to tonight's free emotional healing webinar, uh, talking about the whole, emotional healing is the missing link in holistic health care. And this um, webinar is based on my new book, The Heart's Key to Health, Happiness, and Success. So tonight is going to be kind of an introduction to some of the basic principles of emotional healing. And I want to start off by telling a little bit about how I... Um, got started in this, um, and it goes way back to 1986. In, in the end of 1985, I was working for Nature Sunshine Products, and they asked me to um, help put together school for them. Uh, this was like in the beginning of December, and in January, I went on the road um, with the president of the company, Kerry AC, and Jack Richardson, who was their, the number one uh, manager in the company. And we did this whirlwind tour of um, uh, the United States. We, we gave evening lectures in six different cities each week. Um, so we'd give a lecture, go to the hotel, sleep, wake up the next morning, get on a plane, go to the next city, do a meeting that evening. And we, and we were on the road for three weeks in a six cities week, came back for three or four days, and then went out and did three more. And uh, so basically that was my entire month of January. And the first school that they wanted me to teach was in the 1st of April. So now I have uh, get back and I've got two months to uh, put together a, a school that was going to last four days. Um, half of one of those days was, was going to be a tour of the plant and uh, the other half of one of those days was going to be uh, about three other people giving a presentation of about an hour, hour and a half. And the other three days were entirely mine. So basically, I had to uh, develop a curriculum for a three-day course along with handouts and basically help set up this entire program in just two months. And so, as you imagine, I worked quite a, quite a lot of overtime during that period of time. And uh, one week before the first school was to begin, I came home late one night and the house was in disarray and the, the no, nobody had been fed, there was no food or whatever, and I just said, okay, we're ordering a pizza. So we ordered um, the pizza, and I don't usually eat white flour crust pizza. And at that time, I was actually much stricter about these things than I am now. Um, and... Uh, Next morning, I woke up and I just didn't feel well. I had a little bit of uh, uh, diarrhea. I felt nauseous, kind of sick to my stomach, and I thought, oh, right, I can't, I can't um, not go to work today. So I forced myself to get up and go into the office. But when I got to the office, I felt even worse. I couldn't do anything, so I just laid on the floor in front of my bookcase, just thinking, "Woe is me! I've got all this work to do, and here I am, sick. Why did I eat that pizza last night?" But as I was laying there, um, I remembered that one of the books sitting there on my bookshelf had an article in it about um, links between different uh, disease states or symptoms and different emotional states. And I thought, wow, that's, I wonder what this would say about my symptoms right now. So I, I, on a fluke, I, I grabbed the book and I looked up, uh, first of all, diarrhea. And it said, this person sees themselves faced with a meaningful task and wishes it were complete. They wish that it were, were over with and done. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's the school coming up next week. And so I thought, that's interesting. And I flipped over to nausea and vomiting. And it said, this person has done something they wish they hadn't done. They wish they could um, go back and make things the way they were before they did it. And I went, oh my goodness, that's the bed. Um, what had happened is my, my wife had pressured me to go into debt to, to buy uh, a new bed for us. And um, we'd gone to the store. The, the bed that she really wanted, um, they didn't have another one of. And so we wound up settling on a different one. And uh, when it arrived, she still had in her head that the one that she wanted we couldn't get was the one she was supposed to get. And she was really upset. She didn't like the bed that we'd ordered. She, she wanted the store to take it back. She was really upset and dissatisfied. And the, the problem was is it was a custom order and custom stained, and they, they couldn't do it. So basically, they wouldn't take it back. So here I had gone into debt hoping to please her and make her happy, and instead she was upset, miserable, and hated it. So um, I figured, okay, I, I went into all that debt for nothing and so forth. So um, bottom line is, is that 
I looked at that and I said, wow, you know, maybe this isn't the pizza after all. Maybe this is actually just the feelings I'm going through right now. So I had long before learned how to put myself into a meditative state of mind. So I did that and I basically did some self-talk in that meditative state of mind. Uh, I, I said, okay, the Nature Sunshine's never taught a school like this before. They've never offered this kind of experience before. So anything you do is going to be better than the nothing they have before, so don't worry about it. Um, just you know, do the best you can, and that's all you need to do. And, um, and then I thought, and as for the bed, you like it, and so why, you can enjoy it. And if your wife doesn't like it, that's her problem. It's not your problem. And it's interesting, but 15 minutes later, I got up off that floor with no symptoms whatsoever, feeling perfectly well, and was able to work the rest of the day without any further problem. Well, that was a very powerful experience to me because it was the first time I really had seen firsthand how uh, changing a person's emotional state um, could af affect the physical body, and I and I really really wanted to. Um, learn more about that. So later that year, um, I actually uh, was visiting some friends um, in Tennessee, and they had been doing some emotional healing work, and they took me on kind of an emotional healing journey and through some of my life, and had a profound uh, healing experience, profound insights, and it changed something that I had been trying, I mean, I'd been struggling with my whole life, that I, I, I just couldn't seem to shake. Um, and so I uh, was on the plane going home trying to think, well, how is it possible? You know, because I'd actually talked to a counselor about that. I, you know, I'd uh, done a whole bunch of things, positive mental attitude kinds of things and whatnot to try to change that. And the feeling inside of me had persisted. And here, just like turning a light switch on and off, it had just basically completely changed the way I felt inside. And so... Um, the words that came to my mind were these, and um, with that came an, uh, a very profound understanding that has guided me ever since. Evil works in darkness, and that which is in darkness in us worketh for evil, but nothing that is brought into the light can be evil, for all things are made pure in the light. Therefore, whatsoever is brought into light is good and works in us for good. And the idea that came with that was that any emotion um, that I tried to run away from or deny or hide or make go away was going to chase me and haunt me, sort of like the monster in the child's nightmare. But if I had the courage to confront it, to feel it, to go through it, um, uh, that it that it would heal. That there there was that that the way to healing emotionally was not to try to make the emotion go away, but to actually allow yourself to experience the emotion, surrender to it, and and go through the emotional experience. And um, that's really, really different than what most people are trying to do with emotional healing. What most people are trying to do with emotional healing is they're trying to actually change the way a person feels. They're trying to make them not feel depressed anymore or not feel sad anymore or not feel angry anymore. They're trying to change the feeling. And I found that the feeling changed when you actually experienced it and worked through it and confronted it directly. And it and it stayed forever as you were resisting trying to make it go away. And so that became like the guiding principle that I um, began to use. And my first really big opportunity to try this out with another person is a, a little later that year, I was at a conference and I happened to tell the story of what had happened to me to um, a lady there and she said, you need to do this for me. And I said, hey, look, I've never done this before. I, I, don't, I don't know that I would know how to do what my friends did for me. And she says, no, you don't understand. You need to do this for me. And something inside of me said, yes, you do. And so I, I grabbed a friend and I uh, helped her you know, drop into her feelings and face what was inside of her. And she had an extremely profound and very intense experience that was, was, was a very, very healing for her. And that basically hooked me and pretty soon I was doing this with a lot of people, um, helping guide them to to confront and face and feel their feelings and work through those feelings. And it was just a very, very profound thing. It was a deeply spiritual thing for me too and I, ha and I found it very difficult to explain um, 
what I was seeing and experiencing, although I did try teaching some classes in the, in the early 90s um, and kind of shied away from it because I felt a lot of people weren't ready for it. Um, and then I, the latter part of the 90s, I went through a lot of, you know, very serious problems myself, which I had to work through using the principles I had learned about emotional healing, but I had to use them all on me um, because I went through a period where I, I, I got uh, divorced and then uh, and remarried, and then I had an infant son who died, and then uh, a year later my dad died, and the year after that I got divorced again, and the year after that my mom died, and the year after that I went bankrupt. So it's like boom, 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 boom. This incredible series of very, very stressful experiences um, hit me, and I had to learn, I had to use everything that I had uh, learned in working with other people on myself. Um, and so I, through this all, I've, I've struggled to find ways to express what I've learned in simpler ways and ways that could, you know, help other people. And I finally succeeded when I wrote the, the book, The Heart's Key to Health, Happiness, and Success. I, I really boiled this down to a level that I think um, the average person can really understand it, relate to it, and, and get started with it. It isn't everything I want to teach, but it's basically the, the, the fundamentals in a nutshell, and it's, you know, very, very powerful stuff. So, I, um, uh, looking for something here. Okay. Um, anyway, so going on, um, I want to contrast what I'm going to teach you tonight about emotions with what I find to be the culturally dominant viewpoints of um, on emotions that we face in our um, society. The, the first is that emotions are um, primarily a physical uh, phenomenon. That is that they arise from the physical body. So this is the common viewpoint in modern medicine is that emotions are created by chemicals, uh, neurotransmitters and hormones, that we have genetic predispositions to different um, imbalances in hormones and neurotransmitters and those uh, that we can't do too much about. So like for example some of us are prone to depression or anxiety or um, whatever and that therefore the way to fix this is that you give people drugs that basically alter those chemical messengers and that's how you fix their emotional problems. Um, kind of a spin-off of that is to use herbs and supplements instead of drugs to do the same thing. And I'm not saying that that doesn't have any value. I mean, sometimes people do need some, some kind of medication or herbs or supplements or whatever to help them through things and to adjust their mood. But I, I don't relegate feelings to being solely a physical phenomenon. In fact, the, the basic premise that that is operating under is that there is no ghost in the machine. I've actually seen that you know, written in certain books, that phrase, there is no ghost in the machine, meaning that we have no soul, we have no spirit. We're, we're entirely a physical being, and all of this is, these phenomena of thought and feeling are purely physical phenomenon, um, and, and there's no spirit or soul or uh, what, whatever connection in this. Now, I reject that because I happen to do believe we do have a soul and we do have a consciousness. Um, and fortunately, a whole lot of other people do. But with people who do reject that notion, the dominant idea is that emotions are a byproduct of thinking, that they arise from the mind. Um, and so this viewpoint basically says positive thinking leads to positive feelings. So if you're thinking positively, you're going to feel positively. If you're feeling bad, it's because you're thinking negatively. If you change your thoughts, you're going to change your feelings. Um, and again, while I won't argue that thoughts influence feelings, um, because that's obviously true. If I start thinking about uh, a lot of problems and worries and everything, I, it's going to affect my emotional state. I, I don't believe that you know uh, it always works that way. Uh, in fact, in a lot of instances, um, feeling creates thoughts. In fact, in doing emotional healing work, I found that that really intense emotional experiences ha cause people to develop thought patterns. So it works in the other direction too. Feelings influence thinking. In fact, before we uh, 
were able to think, at least in words, we were creatures of feeling. Children feel more than they think. Um, and I've taken people back where they've relived experiences from very early childhood um, before they um, learned language, and they were extremely aware of, of the emotional states of people around them. So, so emotions can exist independent of the, the flow of words in our brain. So Descartes um, was a major philosopher in you know, Western civilization, and he said, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. I'm sure you've heard that statement. And that um, phrase basically has become a predominant worldview in Western society, that thinking is supreme. The, the, the whole you know, idea of like uh, think and grow rich by Napoleon Hill and, and the, the, the DVD The Secret and uh, a lot of other things say that our life arises from our thoughts. Everything arises from our thoughts and um, that we create everything about our life from thinking. Um, I actually attended a workshop by you know, Michael Lozier, a uh, uh, guy who wrote the book The Law of Attraction, which I like the book and I like very much because I really do believe in positive thinking. Um, but you know he he expressed that idea that you know the feelings were a creation of thoughts, and if you were having bad feelings, you just changed your thoughts. Um, I don't find that to be true. I find that feeling is just as important as thinking, and that it stands independent of thinking, and that um, everything does not arise from thinking. A lot of things arise from feelings, um, which we have very very much downplayed in our culture. In fact, if you think about things that you want, um, you're going to find out that your your feelings have a lot to do with this. Because uh, I, I got this concept from a chiropractor that I knew, and basically he would ask people, what do you want you know, out of life? What, what, what um, are you really looking for? And he'd get their answer. And he says, it doesn't matter what their answer is. The next question is, why do you want that? And you keep asking, why do you want that? And he, and he taught me that if you really keep pressing people for why they want things, the ultimate bottom line reason why they want, why we want prosperity, why we want good relationships, why we want health, why we want to feel successful is because we want to feel good. In other words, when you've got that stack of bills hanging over your head and you don't know how you're going to pay them, um, why do you hate that? Because it makes you feel bad, right? Um, and it's that bad feeling that that um, you want to avoid, and that's why you're seeking to do things in your life because you perceive that they will make you feel better. So, what the 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 bottom line carrot on the stick for everybody is wanting to be happy, wanting to love and be loved, wanting to experience joy and satisfaction, wanting to have peace inside themselves. In other words, having good feelings. That whole notion is, uh, is the bottom line motivation underlying everybody's behavior. It's just that um, in a lot of cases, the, I, the ideas that people get in their head about what are going to make them happy uh, can get awfully distorted and kind of weird and, and screwed up. But that doesn't mean that the, the, the underlying motivation isn't the same. But if, if you can understand or grasp that premise, then what you're going to understand is that it's your heart more than your head that's creating your experience of life because your, your heart is what's pushing your choices, um, not the logical things in your brain. It, your, your, your desire uh, to feel good is the, the underlying motivation of why you do the things that you do. And this is true for everyone, no matter how logical they think they are. In fact, in my experience, you take people who you know are really, really big on "quote unquote" logic, and um, and when you challenge them, their thinking on anything, they get really emotional. They have a hard time staying rational. Um, a lot of these people. Any of you who uh, like me don't um, you know agree with vaccinations. Uh, you take you know some of these really quote unquote people who are supposed to be so scientific medical doctors, and you start trying to reason with them about vaccines, and they get really really emotional. Um, and 
showing that their underlying thing isn't actually born of, of reason or logic. It's born of, of this conviction in their heart that is, is very emotionally driven. Um, and a lot of people are just not aware of how emotionally driven they are. In fact, um, James Allen wrote a book called As a Man Thinketh about, you know, the idea of, of thinking. And I've mentioned The Secret and all these other people who are teaching this, this concept that how, what we think creates our, our experience of life. But the, the funny thing is, is that that quotation, as a man thinketh, so is he, is really originates from uh, Proverbs in the Old Testament, and it's not what it says. The actual quotation is, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So it's, it's how we think in our heart that creates who we are. But how does the heart think? Um, that's the question. And the fact that the heart does think is borne out by this book that I read many years ago, uh, The Heart's Code, by do the late Dr. Paul Pearsall, who's a psychologist. And in this book, he talks about the phenomenon of um, uh, memory transfer uh, from people who have um, uh, had organ transplants. Like people, people, for instance, who have liver transplants will often acquire the food preferences of the person that they got the organ, the liver from. And the heart is particularly prone to memory transfer. And he tells some really fascinating stories about this, like a girl who got the heart from a young girl who'd been murdered, and she started having nightmares about the murder. And she was able to describe the murder scene, the murder weapon, and the murderer, which actually helped police you know, solve the case, um, which, which shows that the heart the organ, the heart, had those memories inside of it. Um, and, and this relates to a concept that, that a lot of people just don't understand, that memory is not st all stored in the brain. Memory is actually stored in every cell of your body, and the brain acts like a switching station that connects with all that, those memories. So, you are, so tissue has memory. You, when, when a certain part of your body is traumatized, that part of the body can remember that trauma. Um, one of the most interesting stories to me, um, the, um, okay, that's interesting. That's a good question, Angela. I'm going to come to that in a second. So the, so the, uh, this one uh, woman, uh, she and her husband had been in an auto accident and he'd been killed. She'd survived. And his heart had been transplanted into a Hispanic, young, a young Hispanic man uh, who didn't speak English. And Dr. Pearsall had arranged for her to meet him. And uh, they were waiting for him to show up. And uh, he, it was about, it been about 20 minutes or so, and he hadn't shown up. And Dr. Pearsall suggested, well, let's leave. And she says, no, he's close. I can feel him. And right after she said that, this young man walked in the door. She could feel that heart. Okay, and I'm um, going to give you a little bit of understanding about how that uh, that happens a little later. But he came in and he had to speak through a translator. And I, if I remember correctly, his mom was the translator um, because he didn't speak English. So she just felt overcome with emotion with this young man, and she asked if she could put her hand on his chest over his heart, and she laid her hand over his his heart, and she just she just felt it for a minute, and then she took her hand off and said, it's copacetic. And the mom said, what is that word? Um, she said, "He ever since he got out, came out of surgery, he's been saying it's copacetic, and neither one of us know what that word means. Well, she said um, that whenever her and her husband um, had an argument, that after they you know, resolved the argument, made up, they would say to each other, it's copacetic. And they were having an argument before they got into this car crash. So the young man who got her husband's heart came out of that saying it's copacetic. That, you know, the, 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 that shows you the power of the heart. You know, the, that the heart has incredible impact, you know, on us. 
And so the but the heart's thinking is in feeling. It's a it's a feeling is a holographic holistic thing. Words are very linear. But 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 feeling is very holographic and feeling often um comes with the uh, the mental part of that is images, imagery, symbolism. So imagery and symbolism are the the kind of emotional aspect of the mental function, but the heart itself, its thoughts are our feelings. And our feelings motivate us. Our feelings literally move us. Um, in fact, we really have three minds. I mean, you know, the we have a gut brain, which basically the intestines grow out of the same um, embryonic tissue as the brain, and every neurotransmitter found in the brain is found in the gut. And that's why we have gut instinct, and we have gut feelings, and the guts, our guts talk to us. That's the, the body, you know, is intelligent. The body communicates information to us. Um, and so we have to learn to listen to what the body says. But I think of the heart as the brain of the emotional world. Um, 60% of the cells in the heart are nerve, are nerve cells, not muscle cells. And so this means the heart has a tremendous capacity for processing information. And so it's not just our brain that thinks. Our body thinks and our heart thinks, but they just don't think in the same way that our brain thinks. So uh, actually this slide should have come earlier, but this is that positive thinking model, you know, that, that thinking creates feeling which creates action. But um, I actually... Um, look at it this way. I see the the thought, feeling, and action, or the mind, body, and spirit as co-equal partners, each which affects the others. So like I mentioned before, you know, your your the well-being of your physical body can affect your emotions and affect your thoughts, uh, but your thoughts affect your body and your feelings affect your body. It's a two-way street. And again, your thoughts can affect your feelings, but your feelings can affect your thoughts. So this is why I don't like create this. As, this is, I don't see this as a hierarchy. So I don't see like that, that I just work on the body or I just work on the thoughts or I just work on the feelings. I try to work on all three because my idea is, is that when our thoughts and our feelings and our actions, which is the, the doing part aspect of our nature that comes from the physical world, are in alignment, we have internal harmony. When they're not in alignment, when what we think and what we feel and what we're doing are not congruent, we have internal disharmony and that makes us sick. So um, you have to give equal credence to all of these. So I look at these as three worlds of our existence and I really like this model which I got from a book called Emotional Anatomy which the idea is, is that we actually literally have three chambers in our body. Um, the, the first chamber is up in our skull, and it houses the brain. Um, and, and so that's the world of our head, and, and in the world of our head we also have our organs of perception, our eyes, our, our smell, our, our taste, our hearing. To, to let information in. That's the mental processing world. And then we have a chamber in our chest that separates from our abdominal cavity by a big muscle called the diaphragm that houses our heart and our um, uh, lungs, which both of which pump, which have this rhythm, you know, uh, the, the, the breath of life, which is why I think of this as the spiritual world. We, you, the breath is the, is you breathe in this, the spirit of life. Um, and I also look at the heart world as, as being spiritual because, you know, the the feeling of, there's a, a feeling of love, which could also be called the spirit of love. There's a feeling of anger, which also could be called the spirit of anger. And I see those um, that emotional state as a reflection of our spiritual state. So that the idea is, is that a, if a person, you know, develops, you know, spirituality, they would become more loving, more positive, more, you know, all in all have this, you know, patience, uh, meekness, all these emotional qualities that we perceive of as good rather than negative. So that's why I, I equate those. So you can call these worlds anything you want. I mean, there's lots of different 
kinds of psychology, and I think these three worlds have been looked at in a lot of different ways. You know, body, mind, and spirit, uh, doing, thinking, and being, uh, physical, mental, and spiritual. Uh, the transactional analysis model was child, child, parent, and adult. The Freudian model was it, super ego, and ego, uh, or, or just body, head, and heart. Um, however you want to look at it, that's, you know, your your choice, but we do have these three dimensions to our being, and they're represented by three chambers in our body. Now, if you notice, though, the the heart world is in the center. It's it's the bridge it, it, between uh, the world of our head on the top and the world of our body on the bottom. And in all those psychology things, like in in Freudian psychology, the id, which is the inner child, and the and the super ego, which is the parent, is balanced by the adult, which is in the middle. Uh, same thing with transactional analysis. You have the child, you have the parent, and you have the adult in the center. So the heart world is the bridge. The heart world of emotions is the mind-body connection. Because in order for a thought to turn into action, it has to connect with emotion. So in other words, um, we don't act just because we think something, we act because that thought gets carried into an emotion, okay, movement, and the, the, the emotion powers the movement. And anybody who um, studies sales or marketing will understand this. I mean, people do not buy things, they don't change their behavior, they don't do things differently until they're touched emotionally, until they're emotionally engaged. And, and when someone becomes emotionally invested in something, then they'll change their behavior. Stephen K. Scott, um, in his Mentored by a Millionaire program, says that if you want to change other people's behavior, you want to influence other people's behavior, whether it's in sales or marketing or in your interpersonal relationships, you have to not only get them to understand what you understand, which is mental, you also get, have to get them to feel what you feel, which is emotional. And then he says you're 90% there to getting behavioral change. Um, whereas without the feeling component of it, you, you aren't going to get people to take any action. You're not going to get them to do anything differently. And likewise, it works in reverse too. I mean, how do we get a communication back to our brain that something's going on in our body that we need to pay attention to? Well, it comes as a sensation in the body, which is which is very similar to a feeling, right, um, of pain or discomfort or, or tension or something else in the body that, that registers into our feeling nature and then transmits back up to the awareness of our brain. So basically, things are flowing back and forth through the world of the heart and the world of the heart uh, 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 is a thing. So, um, the there's a, a new way that science is beginning to look at the heart, and the heart is not actually like just physically pumping the blood. It's not just pushing the blood through the circulatory system. There's actually an electromagnetic component to the flow of blood. Um, so the heart actually generates this electromagnetic wave or pulse that carries through the blood throughout the body and generates an electromagnetic impulse. And that electromagnetic impulse um, generates an electromagnetic carrier wave that, that literally broadcasts from our body. Um, and this is one of the things that I, I learned when I started doing emotional healing work. I, I had never really understood that empathy uh, is the capacity to literally tune in to that energy, that's, that emotional energy that's being transmitted from somebody's heart and literally tune in to their feelings to, and, and receive very, very complex information on that electromagnetic carrier wave. Um, and so someone asked a question about you know, the blood, the body fluids. Well, yeah, so what I'm saying is the heart and the blood is carrying this electromagnetic information to every part of the body. And um, and that electromagnetic uh, pulsation is is I I believe what we call emotion, okay. In other words, the the the, the rhythm of the heartbeat and the electromagnetic wave it, it sets 
um, creates the emotional tone of what we're experiencing from uh, from time to time. So heart cells entrain on each other. What that means is is that that heart cells are designed to pick up the electromagnetic pulse of other heart cells and then try to synchronize, to create synchronicity so they all um, beat at the same time and, and synchronize their electromagnetic pulsations. And that's, of course, happening within your own heart as your own heart cells are synchronizing their, their beating. But that also happens between people. That is to say that your heart can, can pick up the electromagnetic pulsation of another person and your heart can tune in and start synchronizing its beat with that pulsation. And if the other person is doing that too, you get this connection that forms um, that links you to, to another, the other person. And we call that empathy or calm passion. Calm passion is, I, I think, is short for common passion or, or shared emotion, shared feeling. So when we are sharing an emotional experience with someone else, we are having compassion. Um, we're 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 tuning in and understanding and accepting their emotional state because we're making a connection with them. And we all experience this um, at some time in our life. Um, we've taught we felt in tune with someone. We've been on the same wavelength as someone. We've been in the same groove. We've had good vibes. You know, good vibrations or we've been in love, okay? That feeling of being in love is basically this connection this, this, that forms between two hearts that, that allows them to readily entrain on each other and share emotional experience. So that, um, and when, we've, when you're having that experience of heart-to-heart -heart connection and communication, it's like you can, you are, you are understanding things that the words themselves are not conveying. In fact, a lot of times you'll find yourself finishing someone else's sentences or, or almost they're thinking something and you'll blurt out the same thing before they say it and vice, vice versa. And this is actually happening because your heart is actually able to, to use that um, emotional carrier wave and like a radio or TV broadcasting station and send extremely complex information to other people and uh, pick up extremely complex information from other people. But it isn't actually just from other people because you actually have the ability to feel the electromagnetic pulsations of uh, animals and plants and even environments, you know, places uh, through your heart and, 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 and sense the, the, them in a very, um, again, holographic, holistic way. You, you can, so I don't know if any of you have ever been someplace where there was a creepy feeling in that place, or there was a really good feeling, a peaceful feeling in a place. Places have electromagnetic energy too, and our hearts pick up on those things. Like, like uh, you know, if you have a place where there was a battlefield and a whole bunch of um, uh, men died, you know, in, in pain and, and terror and all that stuff on there, there's a feeling about those environments. Um, it's almost like there's a, a, a an energetic imprint left over from the tragedy that you can feel when you go to that location. And that's your heart at work, okay? So I'm, I'm trying to explain that the heart is 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 a really powerful instrument for, for tuning into things. Um, now, with that, I'm going to just you know the, switch um, over to explain something. Because, but this is important again for understanding emotions. Even though this is more talking about the physical body than it is about the heart. Um, whoops, I got to go back up here. Um, I'm trying to find my pointer. There it is. Okay, so you you know we don't we like to feel pl pleasure. We don't like to feel pain, but we need both. Okay, both of them are actually good um, because without pain, we wouldn't know that our body was injured or that something was injuring our body. So we wouldn't know that hot stoves burn us. We wouldn't know that, that cutting ourselves with knives is not good for us if we didn't have pain. And when I talked about this on the uh, educational cruise that Nature Sunshine had in the beginning of June, someone came up and asked me if I'd ever 
uh, if I had ever been to a leper colony, and I said no, and he says, well, lepers, um, the disease actually uh, could take away the uh, pain receptors so that a person can't feel pain. So a leper can stub their toe, and they because they don't feel any pain, they don't know they've injured their toe, and then it can like become infected and wind up you know, having to do something. So they have to like constantly be aware of things because they don't feel when they've hurt themselves. And that's part of what happens that makes leprosy a really bad thing. So even though pain is unpleasant, it's not a bad thing. It's not an evil thing. We don't like it, but it, it's a teacher that's trying to communicate things. And since I'd understood that for, you know, for a number of years before I got into emotional healing, I immediately gravitated and understood that the same thing applied to our emotions. There really are no negative emotions, meaning there are no emotions that are bad. There are no emotions that are evil as in and of themselves, the feeling. The, the so-called negative emotions are communicating messages that something's wrong, something's out of whack. There's something that we need to look at, like pain is communicating something's out of whack. And so don't confuse the message with the messenger. Um, just, you know, uh, trying to kill the pain. You know, if you take a painkiller, yeah, you don't feel the pain, but you also are not dealing with whatever's causing the pain. And the same thing's true when you're feeling angry or sad or depressed or, or afraid. If you just try to kill the emotion without first understanding where the emotion's coming from and what it's trying to say to you about what's happening in your life, it'll never go away because you'll never fix the underlying problem. Um, in other words, this is, this is an application that, that works on holistic healing both physically and emotionally. And when I was down at Thomas Easley, he read me this little thing about a book. It says, if you, if you sat on an attack and it's stuck into your behind, okay, nothing you do is going to make the body better until you pull the tack out. And it says, and then it went on to say, and I really like this, and if you sat on two tacks, pulling one out is not going to cause a 50% improvement. Um, <laughs> The, but it's about this thing of understanding the cause. So, so what what happens is when we feel certain painful emotions, um, we tend to because of what we've been taught to interpret that that means something is wrong with us, meaning that that we're bad because we shouldn't be feeling this. And that's not true. Okay, um, there's nothing wrong with feeling feeling anything. Um, feeling our feelings is listening to our heart. So when we just allow ourselves to feel and experience our emotions, we're, 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 we're tuning in to the messages that our heart uh, is giving us. When we just try to deny a feeling or make it go away or, or shove it aside and, and so forth, we, we are failing to listen to the wisdom of our heart just like failing to listen to the wisdom of pain we're, we're failing to understand what our body's trying to say about what's not good for us. So we need to give our heart, and of course the body too, equal status with the mind and, and pay attention to these things. Unfortunately, that's not what we've been taught. Um, what we've been taught is things like, don't be a crybaby, don't be a chicken, don't you dare take that tone with me, uh, wipe that stupid grin off your face. So we've been taught that we shouldn't feel sad, we shouldn't be afraid, we shouldn't feel angry, and in many cases that we shouldn't even be happy, okay? So we tend to try to stuff these emotions, control these emotions, instead of acknowledging them. So we've been basically told since early childhood, feelings aren't important, feelings should be ignored, feelings, you know, you should shove your feelings to the side, but that doesn't work. It just does not work. When someone tells you you shouldn't feel the way you feel about something, it does not change the way you feel. And so either you have to you know, be able to say, well, I still feel that way about it and, and you don't know what you're talking about, or when we're young, we internalize that and, and make think, well, I still feel that way, so something's wrong with me. And that's what most of us have done, is we've internalized that message that something is wrong with us when we feel certain emotions. That, in other words, we're not right, right. we're bad, we're, we're not good people, which is why we want to avoid feeling them, because we don't want to be bad people. Years ago, when I was getting started in this, I read a book um, that was one of the best books I, I 
done with emotional healing called Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. And the title of that book says it really, really well. Uh, it was written by Carol Truman, who happens to live in St. George. Uh, and what it's saying is when you like stuff and suppress feelings, they never go away. They get like stuck, bottled up inside of you. And um, what will happen is something will come along and it will trigger that you know, powder keg of stored emotion inside of you, and that emotion will come pouring out of you, and um, and then you might feel guilty or ashamed because you lost control and you showed all this emotion, and then you try even harder to keep it under control and keep a lid on it. Um, this happens a lot in relationships. It's one of the the things that damages and destroys our relationships. Is is we we stuff our anger, stuff our anger, stuff our anger, and then one little thing happens and we explode and we we vent all over our partner and then they vent all over us and we have this big argument and you clear the air and then everything kind of settles down. But that's because we weren't dealing with the problems as we went along in a constructive way. We were just trying to bury them and pretend they didn't exist. But how, so how do you do this? How do you like stuff emotions? If someone's told you you shouldn't, you know, be angry or you shouldn't feel fear or whatever, how do you stuff it? Well, since emotions express themselves in motion, in movement, in facial expression, in body posture, in body movement, and they also express in vocal tone, not words, but tone, um, I, I, I was doing a little workshop on this in Alabama, and someone asked about the thing, well, you know, aren't, aren't, don't words express emotion? I said, no, they don't. I can take the same word and I can express all kinds of emotions. Oh, 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 okay? Vocal tone expresses emotion. So when you're trying to stuff an emotion, you tense your muscles. You, you, you create tension in your muscles to avoid the movements, to avoid the, the, the bodily expression of it. You constrict your voice. You make your breathing more shallow uh, to try to numb yourself and to try to prevent vocalization. And, um, and this is what happens as you, you know, learn to stuff emotions. So if you look at children's bodies, they tend to be very relaxed uh, and very supple. Children have usually have extremely good posture when they're little, uh, very natural state of balance you look, once they learn to walk. They breathe properly from their diaphragm. They are able to breathe very deeply and very relaxed. As we get older and we learn more and more to hold back stuff, our feelings try to take in control of all of our emotional energy, um, we become more and more shallow breathers and we carry all this tension in our body and it changes our posture and distorts our face and does all kinds of things to us. And that's how it eventually makes us physically ill because that tension impedes nerve supply, it impedes blood flow, it impedes, it impedes lymph drainage, the shallow breathing uh, impedes metabolism and oxygenation of the body and eventually this stuff will make us very stiff so we, and, and very sick. So in my book, The Heart's Key, I, um, I talked about emotional dams. And I used the D-A-M-N because uh, when you dam an emotion inside of you, what that means is you condemn it. You, you damn it. And um, so you, you judge that emotion as evil, bad, wrong. And when you, when you um, do damn it in that way, you create a dam that basically tries to hold that emotion in, which that dam is created of tension in your body. And that builds up a reservoir of, of that emotional energy that's longing for release, that's trapped behind that tension. And the, the more that happens, the greater the amount of tension it takes to stay in control and the more afraid you are of experiencing that emotion. So, you know, if you stuffed your anger long enough, you, you're totally afraid that, you know, if you ever gave into the anger, you'd probably just, you know, go beat the tar out of some people and do some things that you would really regret. Or maybe if you've stuffed a lot of grief that you would just literally fall apart, you know, and have a nervous breakdown if you let yourself feel it. But this is what happens and it becomes scarier and scarier to try to, to feel it. Now, stuffing and suppressing your emotions is not the, the only way to deny them. There is another way to deny them, and it's called venting. Um, and I want to explain that expressing a feeling is not 
venting it. Okay, uh, I want to make this distinction really, really clear. You know, like crying is not necessarily venting grief and being angry and and clenching your fists and 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 you know, uh, getting angry about something is not necessarily venting your anger. Venting is is placing the responsibility for the emotion outside of yourself, so that you're what you're doing with your emotions is you're trying to change, use your emotion to change the external world to your benefit because you believe that unless other people or situations change, you cannot be happy. So you are locked into a power struggle trying to change other people and life circumstances in order to make yourself happy. In other words, it's placing the responsibility for your emotions outside of yourself. And that makes you powerless to heal anything with your emotions. So when you're venting your emotions, you're trying to change the outside world to change how you feel about yourself. And the inner belief is that if I can't get these other people in situations to change, I can't be happy. But that's an illusion. And it's an illusion that prevents us from having to confront those emotions. We get to dodge them because because if we don't place responsibility for them, we don't have to feel them because we're because we can't change because there's no way to change them unless we change other people. So again, it's it's a it's a dodging behavior. But the truth is is that since your your heart is being drawn electromagnetically to different people to different situations then the truth is is that your emotions are guiding your choices of who you associate with um, what you do in life the choices that you make in life and so your your emotions are literally creating your experience of life not the other way around and therefore if you want to change your life circumstances you have to work on dealing with the feelings and changing how you feel now a prime example of this in, is is with relationships. Um, what happens is um, people are in a relationship, a bad relationship, they get divorced, they break up, and then typically they go back right back into the same relationship pattern. So for example, in, they marry someone who's uh, an alcoholic and they divorce them and then wind up in a relationship with another alcoholic. Or they... Uh, are married to an abuser and they leave them and they wind up being married to another abuser because because their heart is attracted to that because it 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 matches what their inner emotional experience is if that makes sense to you so until they heal their inner emotional experience they continue to be attracted into the same negative situations negative relationships negative people. So uh, the, the truth is, is the, the experience of your heart is creating your life, which is why as you're thinking in your heart, that's what creates who you are. Okay. Um, so um, in, the, in the book, I talk about uh, the three primary emotions that people regard as negative. And this is where I was able to really um, simplify this down to kind of help, really help people grasp this concept. So just like you can mix millions of colors from the three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, so you can mix uh, hundreds of, sh of subtle shades of emotions by various combinations of these three primary emotional states. Um, Anger, grief, and fear. So I've put anger and aggression as red, like, you know, red with rage, seeing red. Um, blue as grief or sadness, like feeling blue. Yellow as um, uh, chicken, scared. Uh, yellow streak down the spine, yellow bellied, um, or, or feeling yellow. Um, but if you, okay, white light contains all of the colors of light. So basically, what I'm trying to say here is, is if you're able to freely move through all of your emotions and, and understand them, your general emotional state is going to be one of, of happiness, inner peace, um, and, and a feeling of love and connection. This is generally the way children, healthy children are. Um, they're usually happy. 
sometimes they cry, sometimes they're angry, and sometimes they're afraid, but they're usually happy. Um, it's only as we learn to deny parts of our emotional nature that we become really out of balance and out of whack. And the more we suppress certain emotions, the more out of balance we become, and the more our personality gets colored with the um, uh, emotionally colored, and we're no longer able to access our, our normal balanced state of um, joy, happiness, and peace. So what I'm saying is, is that while there are no positive or negative emotions, um, other than the fact that some emotions are communicating something's wrong and other emotions are communicating that things are good, um, there are three um, ways we can deal with any emotion, and two of them are negative or destructive, and the, uh, the third one is the positive way to deal with that emotion, the balanced way to deal with that emotion. So suppressing is one. We've talked about that. That's, that's like Tense, creating tension in everything that doesn't allow that emotion to be uh, expressed. And you can get so good at that that you deny that you even ever feel that. Um, and you can also vent it, which means that you are busy trying to change other people and change your relationships and do all this stuff because you're convinced that that's the only way that's going to change that emotion, which is another way to dodge it. The third one is actually to feel the emotion. And like I mentioned, when you just feel the emotion, you don't try to make it go away, and you don't blame it on somebody else. You just experience it. You actually, your heart will actually teach you things. It will communicate information to you about what you need to do differently in your life, and and how you need to change the kind of choices you're making. And you'll see that clearly, and you'll be able to take action that will bring you back to a state of a more balanced state of happiness. Now, it's easy for me to say that. But actually getting someone to do it, including myself sometimes, is, is tricky. Now, when you, when you strongly suppress one of these dominant uh, or primary emotional states, it creates a shadow emotion. So, for example, if you strongly suppress anger, you're going to have a big tendency towards depression, discouragement, and jealousy um, or, and envy, which is green. Um, if you strongly suppress grief, you're going to tend to become hard, cold, insensitive, calculating, kind of emotionless. But it's 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 actually a, a state where you're you're afraid of everything, and you you'll use this kind of anger closed off thing to protect yourself from any kind of vulnerability. And if you suppress you know uh, fear very strongly, you'll become compulsive, addictive, reckless, thrill-seeking kind of personality. So I, those are what I call the shadow emotions, and I've put them as the colors um, green, orange, and purple to help with the model. Okay, so what we're going to do real quickly here is we're going to go through, and I'm going to explain uh, what venting anger is, what suppressing anger is, what the constructive use of anger is, and then do the same thing with grief and fear. So venting anger. Now remember, okay, just because I get angry does not mean I'm venting anger. If I say, I feel really angry with you right now, I'm very upset with, with what you just did, I just, I just want to just get away from you right now or whatever, that's expressing anger. That's not venting anger. Okay. When you're venting anger, you're trying to control other people's behavior through either violence, you know, punching, kicking, hitting, hurting them, um, or threats of violence, you know, threatening them to do that, or intimid intimidation, which is implying that you that you might do it, or you making belittling judgments, which is calling people names, saying you're stupid, you're an idiot, you're blah blah blah, you're you're selfish, you're blah blah any anything like that. Um, doing threats, which is basically saying you know you don't do what I want, then you know then this isn't going to happen like you know if if you know withholding which is usually a thing of threatening to withhold something that's of value to the other person um not necessarily to do damage or harm to them or maybe to do damage or harm to something that they that's important to them or the more subtle one is is manipulation which is basically trying to make them feel you know guilty and bad about themselves because you know you you're, you're doing this stuff. That's a, that's a more subtle form of anger, 
one of the more more subtle shades of it. But basically, it's all designed that you want to control other people solely for your benefit. You don't care whether it's good for them or whether it's right for them or there's any benefit in for them. They owe it to you. They should change. They should change because whatever reasons you've rationalized in your head, they should change. And so you feel perfectly justified in letting them have it and um, letting them know, you know what creeps they are if they don't do it the way you want. Okay? And that's actually a failure to love other people because you're basically it's it's a totally self-centered you know activity because you really don't care how they feel what they think or anything you just want what you want and you're willing to do things you know to cause hurt and pain with them to get it now we look at that and we go a lot of us look at that and go I don't want to be like that so we run to the opposite extreme and we completely suppress anger but when you completely suppress anger what happens is you wind up allowing other people to control you for their benefit. So instead of you being the controlling one, you are you're the controlled one, and then um, and and generally you do this in the belief that if you give in and give them what they want and placate them and pacify them and so forth, that they're going to love you and they'll want to reciprocate and do the things that you want them to do and so on and so forth, which really isn't true. Um, and you allow other people to hurt you and abuse you and take advantage of you and so forth when you suppress anger, which really suppressing anger is a fail, failure to love yourself. Um, finding the healthy balance in anger is actually finding the balance of the, the uh, love your neighbor as yourself to love the other person and also love yourself so that you you don't allow them to abuse you but you don't abuse them either that's the sweet spot you see um, where where when you learn how to use anger in that manner it actually helps you maintain that thing it's called uh, personal boundaries so the constructive use of anger is is uh, is the, pa the power to protect yourself from harm and physical uh, and emotional um, abuse okay we have a right to protect ourselves, and we also have a right to say no to things that don't contribute to our mental and emotional well-being. But we, we will lack the power to say no, and we'll lack the power to protect ourselves if we aren't connected with the energy of anger to fuel that. In other words, if, if, if someone is, is you know, physically attacking you, you need to be able to connect with your anger. With your, and anger comes from the physical world, from your guts, okay? Um, because it creates separation. It, it pushes things away. And um, in order to be able to fight, to defend yourself, you have to be able to tune into that anger, to that, the, those guts. And the same thing to give power to your no, that when, when you say no to something, that people feel that you really mean it, and it's not a maybe that they can then talk you out of, you have to, again, be in touch with your anger. And so if you aren't, you're a doormat. You may say no, but there's no power behind it, and therefore nobody takes you seriously, and they continue to walk over the top of you. So constructive anger gives you self-control. It gives you the power to to control your own life, to be in charge of you, and we call that willpower. It, and and it, in some, a lot of different cultures, the liver is the seat of the will and the seat of anger. Um, or, or we can also talk about the guts as being the seat of will and the seat of anger. And so, again, it's down there in the physical world where we really have that power of, of anger to create separation and to say no to the things that don't work for us. Now, grief, uh, if, if anger is the more physical emotion, grief is more connected to the, the spiritual or emotional part of ourselves. Now, uh, I'm, I'm using the word spiritual in a very, I, I, I use what I call functional definitions. That means that, that, you know, I know different people have different viewpoints of what different words mean, but I explain to people what I mean when I use a word just so people will understand what I'm talking about when I use that word. If the physical creates separation, if it makes me distinct from you and other things, the spiritual creates connection. Love, which is the, the, the highest form of the spiritual, bonds things, bonds people together. When, when, we, when we have love, it creates uh, 
couples and families and and communities and um, nations and uh, connections with nature um, and connections with animals and pets and and plants and everything love joins us love love creates connections and so the spiritual creates connection it 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 allows us to open up open up our heart and and entrain or connect with other things and create oneness or, or unity. I hope you can all grasp that idea. So when we lose something we were connected to, when we lose something that we were in love with, that we had a good vibe with, a good connection with in our heart, we feel grief. And, and grief is that sense of loss of that connection. Um, and it's the desire to have that connection again. Uh, about the longing of our heart to to reconnect. So uh, again, I want to make it really clear because someone asked a question about this on the last webinar. You know, about like if I am feeling grief and I go talk to a friend about you know the, my sadness or whatever. No, that is that is or cry on their shoulder. That's not venting grief. Um, venting when you when you do that, people you know will often be very you know understanding and so forth. Um, and we all need that from time to time. We all need a shoulder to cry on. We all need a friend to talk to when you know bad things have happened to us. But you can become addicted to sympathy. You can become addicted to people feeling sorry for you. You can become addicted to being a victim, and 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 go around using your your the stories of your losses and the stories of your heartbreak and everything to win sympathy and support from other people. It, and, and use it in a, a kind of a manipulative manner to get other people to be willing to do things for you because they feel sorry for you or they you know feel bad for you and and it and it can become a pattern in your life that 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 you are a victim you just you are constantly making yourself a victim um, and looking to other people to rescue you and fix you and help you and so on and so forth. And, and give you the love you're longing for, okay? Now, you can go to the opposite extreme on this, and you can totally suppress your grief and your sadness, which since the, the grief was born over the loss of a connection, a lot of times what happens here is the person, you know, had this thing that they felt very close to and then, you know, died, left them, or or whatever happened that caused that loss of connection and the pain that they feel over that loss of connection makes them go okay love hurts I'm never going to let myself love again I'm never going to let myself experience that closeness or connection with anyone or anything I'm gonna build this big wall and this big barrier and I'm never gonna let any let myself care that much about anyone because I don't ever want to go through this pain again and so when people do that they create this this impenetrable barrier around themselves that basically they won't let anybody get close to them uh, and they, they put on the appearance of being very logical and rational but they're really cold uncaring unsympathetic and they really uh, don't know how to really receive open up to pleasure and joy in their life and they really can't open themselves up to creating close relationships um, so uh, both of those are very destructive ways of handling grief. When, when you allow yourself to feel the pain of grief, the, to feel the pain of, of the loss and grieve it, which means grieving is letting yourself cry, letting yourself sob, letting yourself moan, letting yourself wail if you have to, um, to like let yourself feel and, and let your body express the pain you're going through. And when you do that, it helps you let go of the hurt and sadness and open you up so that you can be open to new connections, open to new love, open to new things to take the place of what you lost. And and when you are able to do that, when you're you're not afraid to confront your own pain, you actually become a more compassionate, caring and empathetic person. You're you're able to be kinder more loving because you understand you know hurt and you 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 are are familiar with it um, and as I actually write in my book a, a lot of times when you go to the bottom of your grief you also will discover a connection to God because um, many people talk about having deep 
deeply profound spiritual experiences in what they call a dark night of their soul, which is a moment of extreme pain and anguish over, you know, loss and heartbreak, as we call it. So, you know, having this kind of broken heart is a doorway that actually cracks open the, the heart, the hardness of our heart and can actually teach us to be more compassionate, more empathetic, more, more loving if we learn to allow it to, to do its work. Now, okay, so if, if anger is about saying no and separation and grief is tied in with desire and love, which is the ability to open up and say yes and let things in, um, and, and the longing to let things in, um, then fear is about choice. Fear is about maintaining balance between opening up and closing down, between fighting or fleeing, between, um, in other words, fear is associated with, with, with anything where choices need to be made because there is uh, either potential for danger or potential for reward. And, we, and oftentimes, where there's great potential for reward, there's also great potential for danger. So that makes choices kind of scary because sometimes when you're making choices, you don't know whether the choice is going to lead you to pleasure or pain or whether it's going to lead you to joy or suffering. Um, and so it, it's kind of whenever the choice is really big and the situation has a lot of potential danger in it, uh, uh, even if it's just perceived danger, um, you're going to feel fear. And, and fear is, is normal. So if, if this is fear, then venting fear consists of uh, giving away the power of your choices. Because you're afraid of making the wrong choices, you're constantly trying to get other people to tell you what to do. You're constantly seeking the advice of various experts and authority figures to, to get them to tell you what choices you should make. And um, which means you're giving away the power to, to run your own life. Um, and you, you see this with people in medicine. You know, they, they have a physical health problem and it's scary. It's scary, you know, to be faced with cancer or an autoimmune disease or, or any kind of thing like that. So they go to the doctor and maybe what the doctor tells them they don't feel comfortable with, you know, and so they start asking some questions and then the doctor pulls the fear trip on them. If you don't do this, you're going to die. And they buy into the fear and they say, okay, and they let the doctor do whatever the doctor says, even if they didn't really feel good about it. You see, that's, that's venting fear. That's using, letting the fear surrender to other people. And people do this with, you know, religious leaders, with government, you know, uh, surrendering their right to freedom uh, because with promise that government will protect them, solve their problems for them, et cetera. Um, and so you see things, you know, where, where these, you know, uh, you know, little bad things that happen become excuses for more and more regulation, more and more laws, more and more things taking away people's freedom and right to choose for themselves, all in the name of protecting us from harm and danger. This is venting fear, okay? And it's basically losing control of your own life and your own right to make your own choices. Um, now, some people go the opposite way. They're rebellious, okay? You know, they're rebellious souls, and so they tend to suppress fear. And they uh, uh, and deny the fear, and when you deny fear, then you basically also it's the same thing. You you, you often you, you you don't you don't realize that you you need to make a choice. Uh, in other words, you don't realize that you you've got to be careful and try to make a good choice. You basically take that energy that's uh, driving you to do something, fight, flee, make make some kind of action, and you channel it into something that is not really a choice that has anything to do with what you need to make a choice about, um, which which means you can become reckless, uh, impulsive, or you can, you know, you. Okay, let me let me see if I can explain this. Okay, you got a really difficult problem ahead of you, and you're trying to make a decision, and so maybe you know you go out with some friends and have a drink or whatever. I, again, it's not too bad, but what happens if that becomes habitual? That every time you have a problem, every time you're faced with a tough decision, you drink, which becomes a way of avoiding 
having to confront those hard decisions and make those hard decisions, or you eat, or you smoke, or you do any one of things. This, these are all ways of, of suppressing fear. In other words, you, you, you make a choice uh, uh, that's compulsive because it channels the energy of your fear into doing something, but that doing something is not confronting the real issues that you need to confront and do something about, which means that you tend to get engaged in self-defeating and potentially self-destructive behaviors. So constructive use of fear is you acknowledge your fears, you consider the choices and you, you consider your options and make the best choice available, knowing that it could be wrong, but knowing that if it is wrong, then you'll figure that out and you'll change the choice. You always have the power to decide differently in the future. So courage is the ability to make a choice and do something in spite of the fear you feel. Um, the, you, you, in fact, the, the fear is the adrenaline, is associated with the adrenaline rush um, that's, that's giving you the ability to perform well if you are able to make a choice. But um, so the difference between the hero and the coward in the battlefield isn't that the hero doesn't feel any fear. Uh, I'm sure everybody feels fear when bullets are whizzing past you and bombs are exploding around you. It's that they have the presence of mind. This is where positive thinking really comes in to the picture is in the dealing with the emotion of fear. They have the presence of mind to, to make themselves act anyway, to make themselves do something anyway, even though it's scary. Whereas the coward gives into the fear and lets the fear cause them to freeze or, or run away. Whereas the, the hero, you know, acts in the face of their fear. And when you act in the face, learn to act in the face of your fear, it generates self-confidence, self-esteem, and uh, you start to develop confidence in your ability to navigate the the difficult choices and decisions and hardships in life, and that gives you an incredible amount of, of self-power. So what I'm trying to point out is all of these emotions that we call negative, when used properly, will turn into positives in our lives. They will, they will bring us great gifts if we learn how to use them positively. So um, let's talk just briefly about some practical application. Um, because what my main message is, is we need to get back to our heart and make our heart an equal party with our mind and our body in terms of trying to understand this aspect of our nature and use it constructively. And we also need to honor feelings, both in ourselves and our others, and not make ourselves or other people feel bad because they feel certain emotions. And the key is awareness. How long will it take me to solve my problem, the disciple asks? not one second longer than it takes you to understand it, the master answers. That's a vignette from a book called Awakening by Anthony DeMello. And I love it because, because awareness, being able to clearly see what is really going on inside of you is the key to being able to heal these things. Most of the time, the reason we can't solve our emotional problems is because we, we, we don't really know what the problem is. We think we know what the problem is, but if we really knew what the problem is, we could solve it. But we aren't able to solve it because we don't really know what the problem is. So what is awareness? Awareness is, is the ability to observe without analysis, judgment, or um, uh, uh, explanation. It's just be able to take in what's there or take the experience in without having to mentally try to figure it out, okay? And in a, in a state of awareness, you can actually literally detach from your thoughts, your feelings, and the choices you've made in your life and see them objectively. Observe them. You can observe yourself, which is interesting because we think we're our thoughts and we think we're our feelings and we think we're our choices, but know we're something more than that, and that something more than that can observe all that and and see it and understand it, and that understanding um, gives us the power to heal it. To reach a state of awareness, you have to practice stopping the monkey chatter in your brain. This is an easy thing, again, to say. It takes practice to be actually be able to do it. All of us have this flow of mental chatter words, 
phrases, sayings, things our parents said, things the media says, things whatever that are flowing through our brain constantly. And we tend to identify with this, you know, and, and so forth. And this is all in words. And words are labels. Labels are judgments. They're pigeonholing and boxing something and saying, okay, I understand that. That's a dandelion. But, um, but that isn't awareness, okay? When I look at something, give it a label and dismiss it, I haven't really seen it. I haven't really experienced it. I haven't really taken it in because that dandelion I just saw is different than any other dandelion on the planet. It's unique. It's its own dandelion. It's, not just, it's just not the label I've attached to it. So to get to awareness, you're going to see it without the judgment. You're going to see it without the label. You're going to see it as it is without the symbol in your brain. I need to do that. You have to enter a state of sacred, what, what one author um, uh, calls sacred silence. And I like that term. Um, it's, it's really a meditative state, but a lot of people have weird ideas about the idea of meditation. Um, I don't because I learned how to do it a long time ago. And to me, it's not anything like mystical or whatever. It's actually shutting off the monkey chatter in your brain. Um, there are four steps to doing this. One is to just get your body into a relaxed and comfortable position and let your muscles relax. The second one is to breathe deeply. Just breathe slowly and deeply. And then you have to create a point of single focus for your verbal brain, which means that you have to focus intensely on something, um, a thought, like a, a phrase that's in traditionally called a mantra, but uh, Dr. Herbert Benson, who wrote a book years ago called The Relaxation Response, says that just the word one, 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 will work. Anything you want to think, you know, that, that you just are going to just repeat that over and over in your brain will work. You can do it staring at a candle and just focusing your mind on the candle. Anything that creates a single focus of mind um, bores your verbal brain to death, and it eventually will shut up because it wants to analyze it, it wants to explain it, it wants to, to, to create a flow of words around it. If you, but if you um, just passively observe the words and things that come through your head, oh, that was a thought, and then you come back to one, 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 or staring at the candle, or whatever you've created as your single point of focus, it, um, it will eventually shut up, and you'll reach a, a state of heightened awareness. Now, feelings can be the, the single point of focus. And they're a good single point of focus because tuning into your body and feeling your body and and um, feeling what you're feeling can only be done in the present moment. It brings you to present moment awareness. Now, understand that you can think about something and it will generate an, an emotional response in you. You can think about something that happened in the past or worry about something that might happen in the future and you get an emotional response. But if you tune into the emotional response and just start feeling the emotional response, you can't do that and think about it in words at the same time. Um, and furthermore, you can't feel the feeling in anything but the present. You can't feel it in the past, and you can't feel it in the future. You're feeling it in the present. So, um, and learning to do this, learning to tune in to how you're feeling and just let yourself feel it, okay, without thinking about it, without analyzing it, without creating a story around it, is how you do emotional healing. So the most important question in emotional healing work is how do you feel? And this is a very hard question for most people in modern society to answer because they're not used to paying attention to their feelings. They're used to denying their feelings. They're used to burying their feelings. They're used to projecting the blame for their feelings on other people. Emotional healing is about having people learn to acknowledge and accept and experience their feelings. The problem is, is that you can't do that with any feeling that you haven't faced inside yourself. So, for example, if you have never faced your own grief and loss or you've never faced your own anger, you can't help someone else do it. It's impossible because you're going to feel really, really uncomfortable about their grief or really, really uncomfortable about their anger, and they're going to sense that, and they're not going to want to open up and let, let that feeling show to you because they, they sense that you won't be comfortable with it. So as you heal yourself emotionally and you become comfortable, 
comfortable with your own anger and comfortable with your own grief and comfortable with your own fear and comfortable with your own depression and comfortable with your own coldness that you get sometimes, whatever, you are able to empathize or relate to that experience in other people. So one of the things I tell people is any emotion that really, really bothers you when other people are expressing it is one you have a problem with. So if you're really bothered when other people are crying and sad, you have a problem with sadness and grief. If you're really bothered when other people are angry, um, you have a problem with anger. If you're really bothered when other people are scared, you have a problem with fear. Okay, um, It means you have not faced that emotion inside of yourself. If you did, you could understand it in the other person and help them work through it. But obviously you can't do that if you haven't worked through it inside of yourself. So as I mentioned, we have a story. Um, the story is, some, is, the, is the way the brain explains our feelings, explains them away, like it gives the label to the plant and I can dismiss it and I don't have to experience it anymore. But the story becomes a way of people dodging their feelings. And so when you're talking to people, people will tell you their story. And in order to get them past their story, you have to listen past their story. You have to try to tune in to the the feeling that's underneath the story that they need to get in touch with. Because the fact that they're telling this story over and over again, it means that the feeling in it, the feeling that created, out of which the story arose, has never been dealt with. It's never been healed. It's never been processed. So one of the ways you do that as you're listening to this is when they're talking about something and you sense that there was uh, a lot of emotion behind whatever happened, you say, and how did that make you feel? when that happened or you know like when when your mom beat you as a kid how did that make you feel um, and and you can also note their body language and their vocal tone and their posture and other things like that as you you know become more experienced to this and you can say I, I, I sense that you had a lot of sadness around that and you're trying to get them to connect with and understand the feeling and to do that, you have to, and this is the last thing I'm going to talk about tonight, you have to understand the difference between a thought and a feeling. Because most people in our culture have a hard time differentiating between thinking and feeling. And in fact, um, people who are feeling, like me, will often use I feel uh, when I state something, and what they're really stating is the thought. And so when a person states a thought, you have to go into the, uh, you know, and how does that make you feel? you know, um, to get underneath the thought to the feeling that's underneath it. So thinking, anytime, so, you know, the words and labels are, are, are thoughts. Logic and reasoning are thoughts. You know, explaining, you know, something is a thought. Um, judging something, analyzing it, that's thinking. Um, uh, the uh, Telling the story, all that's in your head. When you get sensations in your body, particularly in your chest and your belly, that's feeling. When, when you have vocal tone and body language, that's feeling. Okay? Uh, feelings are difficult to put into words. Um, and so when a person's struggling for words, they're feeling um, more than they are thinking. That's what's in, in your heart. So we're going to do this little quick exercise, and I'm going to ask you, you can, you can get a little pad of paper if you're making notes and, and write down a T for thinking or an F for feeling or you can just kind of do this in your head and I'm going to put a bunch of statements here and I want you to look at that, is that a thought or is that a feeling and see if you can identify what I'm talking about here. I feel that you don't care about me at all. Is that a thought or is that a feeling? I feel hurt by what you said. Is that a thought? Is that expressing a thought or is that expressing a feeling? I feel sad and lonely. Is that expressing a thought or expressing a feeling? I feel like I've been beat up. Is that a thought or a feeling? I feel tense. Thought or feeling? I feel like you're an idiot. Okay. I feel like giving up. I feel nervous. I feel a pressure in my chest. I feel a lump in my throat. I feel scared of life. 
I feel that I will never be able to succeed. Okay, let's see how you did. I did that really quickly. I feel you don't care about me. That's thinking. That's not a feeling. That's a judgment. That's an analysis that's hiding a feeling. And so um, you, you, you get to a, you know, when someone says something like that, to get to the feeling, you've got to say something like, um, what, what are you feeling right now that, that um, you're not feeling cared for about? You've got to dig underneath that to get to the emotional component underneath that. I feel hurt by what you said. Now that's expressing a feeling. I'm communicating that my feeling is hurt, that 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 is connected to what you just said. Okay, that that's an expression of feeling. I feel sad and lonely. That's obviously an expression of a feeling. I feel like beat up. Well, that's that's a thought, really. However, there is a physical sensation to being beat up. So if they're using that to kind of explain the the physical sensation they're experiencing in their body. Um, that that could, there could there could definitely be a feeling component to that. What I do when someone says something like that is, what does that feel like? What does being beat up feel like? To try to go deeper into the emotional component of it, I feel tense. That that's a that's a feeling too. I feel like you're an idiot. That's a thought. There's there's no feeling in that at all. Although, the the emotion that that's expressing is anger. <laughs> okay. So, you know, you might say, I sense that you are angry with me right now. Okay, now you've, you've mirrored back not the, the response to the words that they said, but the feeling of what they were saying that was behind the words. I feel like giving up. Again, that's thinking. Um, what's underneath that? You know, well, what are you feeling? Probably they're feeling discouraged, depressed, sad maybe. I feel nervous. That's a feeling. That's expressing fear or anxiety. I feel pressure in my chest. I've had a lot of times when people get in touch with grief, they feel a heaviness on their chest, a pressure in their chest. That is a feeling. That's actually connecting with the emotion of grief. I feel a lump in my throat. That actually is a feeling. It's a bodily sensation, but that bodily sensation is typically hooked into a feeling. Um, either grief or, 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 or a feeling, you know, that they're trying to hold back. I f feel scared of life. The, the, the scared is a feeling. The of life is kind of adding a thinking component to that. You know, um, what you'd want to do is what, you know, what, are, what about life is scary? You know, get, get, a, get a little deeper into that emotional feeling. I feel that I will never be able to succeed. That's thinking. That's not a, again. That's a, a judgment of the brain, uh, an analysis, uh, not uh, uh, thought. Underneath that could be discouragement, fear, etc. So what I'm trying to explain to you is you've got to get past the story, past the words, past the thoughts, and help people drop down into the the feeling level. And I don't know if you've got any guys here, but I'm going to tell all you guys that when you're dealing with a woman in your life, we guys tend to react very literally to the words um, of of people. So when people make statements, you know, like, I feel that I'll never be able to succeed, you know, we'll tend to say things, well, of course you can succeed. And what we're failing to do is hearing is to hear the emotional message that's trying to be communicated underneath that. And if you train yourself, instead of reacting to the words, to try to tune into what is the feeling that's trying to be contained in those words, especially when you're dealing with women, you're going to be a lot more successful in communicating with them because usually it's not about the words being said. It's about the emotions underneath the words. Women tend to understand that a little better more easily than men do because women pick up body language and vocal tone better than men. But we guys can learn to do it if we pay attention. And, um, and it really helps your relationships because most of the time what people really want is for their feelings to be heard, not their thoughts. And when, when, when we sense that someone has heard and acknowledged our feelings, we feel connection.
um, we don't feel connection so much through our thoughts as we do through the sense that someone uh, uh, accepted and acknowledged our feelings. So I'm going to be teaching an emotional healing class. It starts next week. Um, the first session, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in detail on anger and its shadow emotion depression and talk about how you constructively work with that emotion. Uh, the next session will be on grief and its shadow emotion, hardness of heart. And the third one will be on fear and its shadow emo emotion of addiction and compulsion. So I'm, each of these will be two hours long. So I'm going to, this has only been an hour and a half tonight. So I've just kind of like bar barely introduced this. but. I'm going to go ahead and um, and cover these you know emotions in great detail, and talk about you know how we how you learn to work through these emotions in a positive way rather than a destructive way, and then I'm going to in the last webinar I'm going to talk about you know get into some detail about how you do the practical tools that I talk about in my book The Heart's Key. The webinar is 150 47 dollars and includes a copy of The Heart's Key book. Um, if you don't want to, you know, don't have the money to attend the webinar right now, uh, this stuff is is covered in the book. There are things I will be covering in the webinars that I didn't cover in the book, but that's okay. It's mostly trying to, you know, uh, tell probably more stories and things like that. Um, uh, someone asked if I already have the book, do I deduct the, co the, the that amount for cost? Um, my staff kind of decided that that's what it costs, and we're going to send the book, and we suggest that you sell the other book or 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 give it to a friend or something, because we just it was just really hard to figure. Although maybe you can call and beg them to to make an exception, they just didn't want to they didn't want to mess with that, determining whether the person really bought the book or not. What they were afraid of is that somebody might, you know. Um, claim they had the book and they didn't, and it was real important, we think, that people have the book. You can register at treelight.com or call our toll-free number. And I also want you to know I'm going to be doing a lot of teaching about emotional healing and, and really in-depth stuff. I mean, I really want to share this information um, and help people become proficient at getting in tune with their hearts and helping other people heal this way. So one of the things that's upcoming is I'm also going to be teaching a class on flower essences, an advanced class on flower essences with a good friend of mine, Isadora Tavins, who's really, really good with flower essences. And that's uh, going to be four sessions. And then I plan either this fall or winter to do a rayed iridology class about uh, looking in the eyes and understanding what the eyes say about a person's personality, emotional states, and emotional issues that they need to work on. And um, and I'm also going to be actually traveling some and doing workshops and, and evening cl classes around the country, which will be posted on the website. Uh, can we get massage CEUs? I am not set up to give CEUs for any of my classes at this point. So I don't um, believe that that would be a possibility. Um, I, even though we're to the end of the class and I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, I'm going to go ahead and stay on the line. Uh, if any of you have some questions you'd like to type in, I will answer your um, questions.